Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Chad O. Jackson's Take. I, of course, am Chad Jackson. Uh, I'm excited about this new podcast, as well as some of the films that we have coming down the pipeline. Uh, this podcast in particular gives me the opportunity, if you will, to delve into a lot of the things that are on my brain, especially as of late, as it relates to where we are as a culture, as a society, and where we're headed uh, as a collective. Uh, I hope to use this time to look at some of the concepts and worldviews that are constantly thrust upon us, whether it be in education and media uh, by the so-called public experts or, or public intellectuals, and look at and analyzing and dissecting whether or not these concepts are positive or negative. I happen to believe that they are negative. And again, this gives me the opportunity to flesh out just how they're negative and why they're negative. So if you are interested in becoming a sponsor, either of this podcast or some of the films that we have coming down the pipelines, uh, please email me at chad at malonepictures.com. Uh, this stuff is not cheap. It, it, it takes time. It takes labor. It takes effort to bring it to fruition. And as much as people want films like Uncle Tom 2, for example, which I helped co-produce that came out this year, is available right now on UncleTom.com. As much as conservatives want for content like that to be free, uh, the fact of the matter is, in the same way that you all have a job and you all need money to pay your bills, so too do we. Uh, those of us who uh, help to bring Uncle Tom 2 to fruition, unlike films that come out by PBS or radio programs on NPR that are government funded, we're not government funded. We depend on uh, independent dollars to bring our content, our art, our material to fruition. And so if you're someone who uh, want to contribute to that cause, again, you can email me at chad at malonepictures.com. And so what are we doing today? What are we getting into today? Well, Walter Lippmann is a man who many people in America do not know. They don't know that name and they don't know how his mind shaped modern journalism. And so what you're going to be listening to today is the first part of a five part series uh, on Walter Lippmann and the rise of the expert class. This first episode is a little short, about 30 minutes long. We're going to be laying the groundwork of who Walter Lippmann was and how he explained perfectly uh, social justice movements and its leaders. So without further ado, this is Chad O. Jackson's take. Who is Walter Lippmann? Uh, for those of you who have watched the film Uncle Tom 2, of which I'm co-producer, uh, you probably heard that name. That name probably has a bit of a ring to Walter Lippmann. Uh, Walter Lippmann is one of the young movers and shakers. There's a scene where we talk about the movers and shakers, which is a book written by Mabel Dodge Lujan, who was a art patron, if you will, who lived in Greenwich Village in the early 1900s. She would have these dinner parties at her apartment there in Greenwich Village, where she brought together these young socialist uh, children of elites, fresh out of college, where they were radicalized to believe in Marxism, collectivism, egalitarianism. They were very discontent with what they perceived to be the aristocracy of America, what they believed to be the kind of stuck up, stuffy, uh, Western civilization that suffocated them and they sought to be free from that suffocation. And they were very partial to anything having to do with anarchism, socialism, so on and so forth. And in amongst that group was a young Walter Lippmann. Walter Lippmann went on to establish himself in journalism as well as political advising. His 
friends who are part of that dinner party scene went on to other professions as well, be it entertainment, education, corporate America, colleges and universities, and they were able to get at the heads of those institutions. And in so doing, they were able to slowly but surely, very gradually shift the cultural undergird of America from being a Judeo-Christian ethic to being more of a postmodern ethic. So that's the handiwork of Mr. Walter Lippmann and his friends, who I will get to in later episodes. And so why is Walter Lippmann important? He, he wrote a lot of books that basically expressed his worldview, his thesis, the way he sees things. But why should that matter? I mean, people write books all the time. There's books coming out every week, it seems, on Amazon of people talking about bizarre things that they believe. Well, the reason why Walter Lippmann is important is because we call him, he's praised as the father of modern journalism. And so a man who has received such a moniker is worthy of at least some examination, is he not? I think so. He wrote many books, as I said, but two books come to mind because I have them on my bookshelf, one of which is called Public Opinion, and the other is called The Phantom Public. Now, as you can see from those two books, Walter thought a lot about public opinion and the way people think and the trajectory of a given society at the behest of the thoughts of the people. So this is getting kind of interesting. Here's a man, if, if we can backtrack a little bit, if you can follow along with me, who was a young man who was a part of a dinner party full of socialists and activists who was able to get into journalism. And from his posture as a journalist and a political advisor, went on to write books talking about public opinion and the way people think. So this is enough to make this man interesting, especially when you consider the fact that he is considered professionally as part of his legacy as being the father of modern journalism. So before we go on, let's talk about modern journalism. Let's talk about modern fact checkers, if you will. Let's talk about the people who disseminate information into the public and the extent to whether they are fair, reasonable, honest versus unfair, unreasonable, dishonest. Let's ask ourselves the question, is modern journalism trustworthy or are they not trustworthy? Look at the past three years alone. How did they handle the pandemic in terms of telling the, the honest truth about where the virus came from? About how useful are masks in order to fight the coronavirus? Were they honest about the fact that there was a debate within the scientific and medical community regarding the effectiveness of mask wearing? Or did they choose to take one side and to ride that side and to demonize the other side, even though the people who are talking about the fact that it's not very helpful to wear a mask, even though the people who are saying that are just as credible, just as competent, have the same kind of degrees, have the same kind of medical licenses, so on and so forth, as their colleagues who are saying mask wearing is effective. Why is it that rather than telling the truth about what was going on with regard to that debate, the media decided to plant its stake on a specific side of the argument rather than just being honest? Why is it that the mainstream media thought it was their ethical obligation 
to cover up the truth about the vaccine. People should know whether or not the vaccine is causing blood clots. People should know whether or not there are any credible evidence of vaccine injuries. People should know these things and not be accused of being quote unquote anti-vaxxers for even asking questions. And so, again, when it comes to the question as to whether or not the media, especially as of late, has been honest, are we willing to answer that question as a people? I mean, after all, journalism is the fourth branch of government. You have the executive branch, you have the judicial branch, you have the legislative branch. If it's true that the executive branch is the kind of visionary for the country, the congressional branch or the legislative branch is supposed to make laws and to honor the will of the people to keep the executive branch in check since we don't live in a monarchy. And if it's true that the judicial branch is supposed to gauge the constitutionality and the legality of those laws, if these things are true, then what is the role of the fourth branch of government? Journalism, the press, what is their role? What has been their role? Their role has been to, and I'm talking, of course, historically speaking, it is, in fact, a de facto branch. It's not a formal branch. But their role has been to shape public opinion, to shape the will of the people that the legislative branch is supposed to honor and represent in Congress. And so the question becomes, what is the state of mainstream journalism today? And who is the brains behind the way in which modern journalism operates. Scholars would say that that man is Mr. Walter Lippmann. And so I showed you two books earlier, The Phantom Public and Public Opinion, both written by Walter Lippmann. And now I'm gonna talk about his thesis. What did he believe? What did he believe about the public? What did he believe was the role and responsibility of mainstream journalism? Let's answer the first question first. Mr. Lippmann didn't have a lot of faith in the American people. He thought that the people were generally incompetent. He thought that the founding fathers asked too much of the American people. Namely, that the American people should govern themselves rather than having a lineage of deified monarchs who reign over the people, who reign over the population. Our founding fathers believed instead in the citizenry. That if you are born in this country, then you are a citizen of this country and you have the ability to govern yourself at the municipal level, state level, and federal level. The founding fathers understood that people are autonomous, are individuals. They understood human nature very well. They also understood tribalism. They also understood cultures and how important it is for people to maintain their cultures and to not uh, feel as if they are coerced by the government. And so since coercion uh, breeds discontent and disenchantment, which breeds 
a possible rebellion or revolution, it's important to whatever extent possible maintain the autonomous culture of the people. And so because our founding fathers believed that, they shaped the Constitution in such a way to preserve that. But Mr. Lippman disagreed. He thought that the people were incompetent. He thought that the Constitution was a bad idea. And because of that, what he envisioned was the rising up of an expert class. People who are gifted, who are anointed, as Thomas Sowell says in his book, The Vision of the Anointed, a book I highly, highly, highly recommend because Mr. Sowell's take on this expert class is wholly different than that of Mr. Walter Lippmann. While Walter Lippmann praises these people and say that they should drive and dictate the trajectory of society, Thomas Sowell points out accurately that they have ruined society, that they have infected society, and that even though they have infected society, they still get to enjoy the accolades and the praise and the rewards of being part of the expert class. It's become this kind of circular praise that they bestow on themselves, giving each other Pulitzer Prize and Nobel Peace Prizes and Academy Awards and all the rest. And so this is our expert class. And it's for this reason why we have the Bill Gates of the world the Brookings Institutes of the world, the Bill Nye's of the world. All these people who are poisoning society with their theories and experiments, but they get to enjoy the prestige of their names. Because when people hear Bill Gates, they think of, oh, yeah, he's somebody worth listening to. When people hear Bill Nye, I mean, it's becoming less the case these days because people are beginning to wake up. But when people hear Bill Nye, especially if you were born in the early 90s and he was a part of your curriculum, your teacher would pop on the VHS tape that showed you Bill Nye the Science Guy and you knew the catchy songs and you followed along with what he was doing on television and you grew up thinking that he was an authority on matters relating to science. Female or male, we were taught to see these as binary. Now we're realizing it's more like a kaleidoscope. And now, the Black Lives Matter, he's women's rights, a glorified social justice warrior in the name of science, trying to warn us against climate change. So the world's climate is changing and- uh, He's the expert. We should listen to him. We grew up with him. You see how this thing works? The expert class. That's what Walter Lippmann envisioned. And because the journalists ran with it to where now today you have these journalists who are constantly telling us we should trust the experts, we should trust the science. They know best. How dare you question them? You have people like Anomaly who are quoting verbatim people like Ted Turner and Bill Gates and their agenda to control the population, which is part and parcel with eugenics. Because Anomaly is quoting these people verbatim. He's being threatened by fact checkers and runs the risk of getting his platforms demonetized because he's questioning or impeding on or getting in the way of the agenda of the expert class. Who are you, Anomaly? You're just some guy who happens to be popular Bill Gates is a world-renowned scientist. 
He started Microsoft. He's a revolutionary. He's a visionary. It doesn't matter that he's trying to control the population. If he's doing it, if Bill Gates is doing it, it must be for a good reason. So who are you to question him? I understand that what he's saying doesn't sound good. But he's Bill Gates. You can't question Bill Gates. You can't expose Bill Gates. You can't be the little boy in the story of the emperor's new clothes who, while the entire crowd is fawning over this kind of pretend outfit that the emperor has on, it takes this little boy to see, well, the emperor is actually naked. The emperor actually has no clothes. You can't be the boy who calls out the emperor and who in so doing wakes up all the people around him to see, well, yeah, the little boy's right. He actually doesn't have any clothes on. You can't be that. We won't allow you to be that. We want you to see. And even if you can't see, we want you to pretend to see that Bill Gates has clothes on, that Ted Turner has clothes on, that the expert class has clothes on. For those of you who are unfamiliar with what I'm talking about with regard to the Emperor's New Clothes, I advise you to go and read the story. It's a very, it's a very fitting story for what I'm talking about. Walter Lippmann wants you to think that the emperor has clothes on. He wants you to believe that you are incompetent, that you are in, unable to govern yourself like the Constitution gives you the right to do. That is the legacy of, Bill, of, of Walter Lippmann. So when it comes to understanding history, it helps to, especially over the last 60 years, it's helpful to understand Walter Lippmann because he explains a lot of the social justice movements. He explains individuals over the course of the last uh, century, I would say, who have risen to heights of being trustworthy and notable men for no other reason than the media tells us that they are. People like Martin Luther King, for example. Martin Luther King's rise to notoriety in the 1960s is explained perfectly by Walter Lippmann in his book, Public Opinion, 40 years prior, where he says, when a new policy is to be launched, there is a preliminary bid for a community of feeling. A leader vocalizes the prevalent opinions of the mass. He identifies himself with the familiar attitudes of his audience, sometimes by telling a good story, sometimes by brandishing his patriotism, often by pinching a grievance. Finding that he is trustworthy, the multitude, milling hither and thither, may turn in towards him. He will then be expected to set forth a plan of campaign, but he will not find that plan in the slogans which convey the feelings of the mass. It will not even always be indicated by them. Where the incidence of policy is remote, all that is essential is that the program shall be verbally and emotionally connected at the start with what has become vocal in the multitude. Trusted men in a familiar role subscribing to the accepted symbols can go a very long way on their own initiative without explaining the substance of their programs. That's Martin Luther King. What was the program he was pushing? What was the campaign he was pushing? Collectivism. Egalitarianism. Marxism. You see, you have to understand, what is it that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 gave us? What exactly did it do in effect? What public opinion would have you believe? What journalists would have you believe? What your education system would have you believe is that it ended Jim Crow, is that it made blacks equal and free. That's what they want you to believe. But what did it actually do? It expanded the government's role in private owned companies, private owned businesses, private property, your private property. What is the goal 
of communism? What is the goal of globalism? In part, it's that the government or the state controls the means of production. And so the more the government can intertwine itself and interweave itself in your private property, in your private affairs, dictating how you run it, how much minimum wage you pay, who you do and don't hire. And then from there, a whole plethora of other things because it gets bigger and bigger and bigger over time. And it has since 1964 when the Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed. The more it can get involved in the personal and private things that you have going on and maintain this thought that you have, that I own it, which over time is becoming more and more of a facade, the more it can get involved, the more it can uh, uh, assume the position within your private affairs, the more we are on our way to that globalist egalitarian state. They don't want private property. They don't want you to own private property. They want to control all of it. And so they're going to continue to use social justice movements because they understand that we get emotional as citizens. We get sensationalized. We get all, we get all in our feelings. Martin Luther King often talked about we need to dramatize our demonstrations. It's all about dramatization as if it's this kind of theater because we have to pull on, pe on, on people's uh, emotional strings, on their heartstrings. If we can move you to tears, if we can emotionalize you, then we can backdoor in this campaign. And you think that the campaign or the policy is connected to the emotionalism when it's not. This was meant to achieve that, but there's a disconnect between the two because what you think you're getting is completely opposite of what you, you're actually getting. Has the morale of black America fared well since the 1960s? The number or percentage of out of wedlock births amongst black people has skyrocketed since the 1960s since the civil rights movement. Gang violence skyrocketed amongst black people since the 1960s and the civil rights movement. The number of men at home raising their families decreased since the civil rights movement in the 1960s. The number of women, black women, who are getting married declined since the 1960s in the civil rights movement. We got affirmative action, which causes incompetent people to get into schools that they're not ready for, and to get jobs that they're not qualified for. That's thanks in part to the civil rights movement. Practically speaking, we have not fared well since the civil rights movement. But policy wise, we were able to expand the role of government in its quest to ring in globalism and egalitarianism. So that's it for today. I'm going to get more into Walter Lippmann next time. We're going to look at who he was, what did he believe, how did he contribute to where we are today as a society. So until next time, thank you for watching and God bless. Thank you for listening to Chad O. Jackson's Take. Again, if you wish to become a sponsor of this podcast or some of the film projects we have coming down the pipeline, please email me at chad at malonepictures.com. And until next time, thank you and God bless.